Good morning, Alpine Bible Church. Again, it is our pleasure to greet you this morning through this medium. We are glad that we have uh, the opportunity and the technology to do so. And uh, we are just so grateful for what the Lord has been doing in our midst. Even through these circumstances, we continue to hear uh, great reports, praise reports of how the Lord is encouraging uh, the saints and how he is using these videos and these live streams. And so even though we are not together in person, uh, we can rejoice together. And this morning, as is tradition, uh, it is important, even in your homes, maybe with your children present, your grandchildren present, or maybe even with your neighbors listening, that they hear us as we rejoice. He is risen. Amen. He is risen, he is risen indeed. And so this morning we gather together, even in our homes, separately, we rejoice because that is the truth of the gospel, that Jesus Christ has overcome sin and the grave, and he is risen indeed. And so this morning, again, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather. I just want to go over a few quick announcements. Again, as we have made mention each week, please utilize the technology platforms that we have but I am also mindful to remind many of you that some of our folks do not have all of these platforms. And so please, men and women of Alpine, most of you have a directory. Most of you even have uh, a piece of paper somewhere with names and numbers. And so please make it a point today or through this week to just check on each other. Make it a point to Find out if everyone is doing okay, if they have information they need to share. And then, of course, for those of you that continue to have the Facebook uh, platform, uh, YouTube, uh, commenting and, and liking and doing, uh, doing those types of things, we're grateful for that. But please be mindful of those that may not have that ability to stay connected and make sure that we connect with one another as best we can in these coming days because we still have a few weeks left, um, as best we know, that we'll have to utilize uh, this method. So please be mindful of that. As we have mentioned over these last couple weeks, uh, we've had to shift some of our giving. And so again, we want to rejoice with you. And I pray that you are encouraged. Uh, we want to just thank the Lord that up to this point, uh, the Lord has been very gracious and merciful to our body, to the people in our body. And so many are continuing to have the ability to work, even if it's adjusted. And, uh, and so we want to just say thank you to the Lord, but thank you to you for obeying him and continuing to give. And please continue to do so. As we have already mentioned, we have obligations to, uh, to many folks, including our missionaries around the world. And we want to be faithful to those commitments, and we want to be ready for everything that the Lord asks us to do as a church family. And so having those resources available is certainly a blessing. So continue to give online, and if you need help with that, feel free to call into the church or uh, call one of the pastors or um, you know whatever is necessary for you to, to do that. Or you can simply just mail your check in, and we'll continue to... Uh, to collect the tithes and offerings that way. In addition to that, uh, please just continue to stay informed for uh, weekly services, uh, special announcements, different things like that, and we will continue to try to connect and, uh, and be with one another in that way. We again want to just mention that if you have prayer requests or needs, we really need you to bring those to our attention, especially in these times where we're not connected. So please feel free to, uh, to contact the church office or, uh, or post something so that someone uh, is aware of what's going on. I feel it's just appropriate this morning. Let's begin with just a, a word of prayer, and then we'll shift our attention to our time of singing together and then our time of study. So let's pray. Father God, we, we glorify you this morning for rising. We glorify you for your perfect plan the plan of our salvation, the plan of our redemption. We glorify you, Father. We honor you. We celebrate you. We have hope and we have joy because of what you have done. 
And this morning, Lord, it is just a privilege. It is a privilege to know you, to be called your child, to be able to sing to you and to rejoice with you. Father, I'm asking that you would just bless this time as we sing to you. Would you, in fact, enable us to sing the way you deserve? Lord, may it be a joyful noise. Would you, Father, give us the ability to study, to comprehend your word, to apply it to our lives, to be changed, Father, not for our sake, but for your glory. Would you use all of these things, Father, that the world might know that it is true that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. We love you, Father, and we love to sing to you. Would you bless us now? as we turn our attention to song. We pray these things and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
truth. What a beautiful song. We're going to, in a moment, sing two songs uh, back to back. Both of them uh, very much emphasizing the truth and the reality of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, the resurrection status of Jesus Christ, but also um, just the truth of what that means to the believer. And so this morning, I just want to read a passage out of 1 Timothy. It's a passage that I have underlined in my Bible and have come back to repeatedly in my life and in my relationship with Christ because of my nature apart from Jesus Christ. These are the words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'll I'll start in verse 12 because it just provides context. I thank Him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In addition to that, I just want to read quickly Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I have nothing to offer to you but Christ. I have no words to offer you but Christ. This morning, we stand in front of you and we sing, we rejoice, but it is not us. It is Christ in us. I have hope. I have joy. But it is not in me. It is Christ in me. My life is hid with Christ on high because He is risen. He has overcome 
my sin, my debt. It is paid for. And He lives to make intercession for me and for you. I pray that this morning, Easter Sunday morning, that you are able to rejoice with us and to give praise to whom it is due, Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer. And I pray that in these coming days, as we continue to encounter the uncertainty of what the future holds, that as children of God, we remember who we are. We have been bought by, by Christ. We have been bought with a great price. And it is our privilege to die daily that He might live in and through us. That He would bring glory to Himself through us. Whatever happens... Not my will, but yours be done. And so men and women do not lose sight of the grace of God, of the mercy of God, but of the fact that He rose and overcame so that you might have life and have it abundantly in Him. And that you might be the person that He wants you to be and that you might do what He wants you to do for His glory. We have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer we who live, but it is Christ living through us. May He receive all glory, honor, and praise this morning in your homes, in your workplaces, and in the midst of this pandemic. May His name be lifted high in this place and all over the world. As we sing these last two songs, again, it is our, it is our desire that you know Jesus. And it is our duty and our privilege to make Him known to you. If you are sitting there and you are listening to these words, and you are hearing these songs, and you still do not know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. The invitation is open. You do not have to be here, and you do not have to come forward. It is a decision between you and the Creator of the universe. He is righteous. He is holy. He is unable to tolerate sin. We are born into sin. No one is righteous. No, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is only one way to receive forgiveness for sin, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ, through what He has done on our behalf. And so we invite you to believe. It is faith like a child. It is simple. So this morning as we finish our time of singing, may the words of these songs and the words of Scripture impact your life, challenge you, and may you put your faith in Christ. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love.
Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. What gift of grace is Jesus my
Amen, church. Rejoice. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Walking through the death of a loved one is something that leaves us with feelings of coldness and finality. A body is given to a mortician, a casket is selected. We stand by a lifeless body and uh, attend a, a, a graveside burial. It's one of those dark valleys that many of us, most of us have to go through at some point in time and we will do so again. And it reminds us that death is the greatest enemy that we have. Death brings us to a place of finality. It, it's a closure that is so cold and uh, lifeless, and it just removes any opportunity for choice. It removes the opportunity for future or for hope. And so we often uh, find ourselves left wondering what's next when we lose someone that's very close to us. I want to present today the story and the facts by which we as Christians state our claim and upon which we stand unshakable in the face of this enemy. I want to draw our attention, first of all, to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one and only Savior of the souls of men. 
And first, we want to see our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as the king in the grave, because that's where our story today begins, with the ending of a life. He died on the cross. He was removed from the cross by two men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. He was uh, then wrapped in uh, cloths uh, with uh, 100 pounds of, uh, of fragrance, uh, and, and so on, and then placed in the empty tomb, uh, a stone rolled over the entrance of the tomb, and that was the end. It had to have been a very sobering moment for those who followed Jesus to realize that the one that they placed their hope in is gone. Uh, Jesus is the one who claimed to be the Son of God. He's the one who claimed to have existed before Abraham. He's the one who declared that anyone who would come to him and believe in him would have received eternal life. Uh, he's the one who told uh, Martha, the sister of Lazarus in John chapter 11, that he was the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, he said, though he may die, yet shall he live. He went on to say, and whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Well, this very Jesus was battered and broken and crucified on a cross and then buried in a sealed tomb. And so how could anyone claim to have existed before he was born? How could one offer eternal life and then promise that believing in him would mean never dying? especially when he himself was now dead and buried. The fact is that anyone who would claim such things and then come to death themselves, to me, would have proven themselves to be a liar. They've lived a lie. They've taught a lie. And yet his followers, they witnessed him healing all kinds of sickness and disease. They uh, watched him uh, heal lame people and blind people brought back to sight. He, he, uh, he raised people to, uh, to life who had died. And so there was this sense of hope in his words. There was this uh, understanding that uh, witnessing the works that Jesus did fortified the faith of all the believers. They followed him because they believed in him and Finally, here he is now buried, and he's gone. There would have been such a sense of hopelessness, such a defeated uh, uh, sense of what has happened, what, what, what is now our purpose. We placed our faith in this, and now he's no longer there. It would leave you empty and deflated and, and just not knowing what to do next. Well, thank goodness the story does not end in chapter 19 of John. And so in chapter 20, we pick up the story here. and We see in this story a whole new thing that we're going to look at today. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That's a reference to John. And said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Uh, uh, first of all, just to understand that, you know, uh, Mary has gone to the tomb early, uh, perhaps just to check on this. But we also know from the other gospel writers, uh, Matthew says the other, there was another woman named Mary, the mother of James, who was also there. Mark adds a woman named Salome who was also there. And Luke added another name, Joanna, and others, he writes. And so there were at least four or more women who had gone to the tomb to see the stone rolled away. Uh, and so in verse 2 of our text, it says that Mary ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter therefore went out and the other disciple who were going to the tomb. And they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there. Yet he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been wrapped around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw and believed. So interestingly enough, there's this sense that they're seeing something and uh, what's interesting is that the word saw here is used three times. Now John saw, then Peter saw, then John saw again. But each time that word is used, it's three different words in Greek, which means there are three different meanings to the word saw. And I think that that's actually kind of important. The first uh, one is, is when John came to the tomb, he looked inside. He obviously saw the body was gone, and that's all he saw. He didn't go in, he, oh, he just saw that, okay, that Jesus is not there. But, but that word saw is the word blepo. It's a, it's a description of a word that we uh, commonly understand. For example, uh, if I'm driving in my car and I'm going down the highway, I might have my mind on one thing I'm looking for, but on the way there, I see many things. But the fact is I don't register anything that I see. I can often forget where I've been. And I get to the place that I'm looking for, and that's what I was concerned about. Uh, and that's kind of what the word means. And then you have Peter who runs in after John, runs all the way into the tomb, and Peter saw, and that word was therio. It's the word we take our word theory. It's, it's, what, a, uh, it's what someone who's inspecting uh, a problem or a concern or an issue or just something that they, they want to understand. They, they, they theorize, they, they ponder, they postulate what, what, what's happening. So Peter looked around and he saw the grave clothes there. And he saw how they were still wrapped as though they were still around the body. Uh, he saw the head coverings as though it had been wrapped still around the body, but now they're all flattened out, still neatly there. And, and then John rushes in after Peter. Uh, Peter's still theorizing. John comes in and he saw uh, the same thing that Peter saw, and uh, there's a different word for what John saw. It's oreo, not oreo. It's oreo. It's a word that has to do with understanding. So it says, John saw and believed. Now, they saw the grave clothes lying there. They saw this incredible sight, and as they're thinking through this, we would understand that the critical issue is this. This was not Jesus having been resuscitated. This was not Jesus who had fainted on the cross, came back to, uh, uh, to a, uh, awaken and so on, and got up and left the tomb. Uh, the grave clothes were such that, which would have been impossible for grave clothes to still be in the exact same place, in the same design, uh, still wrapped, but yet no body inside them. That would have been impossible. Uh, this was not a resurrection like what Lazarus had. You remember Lazarus, the friend of Jesus. Jesus went to Lazarus' tomb. Uh, he had been buried four days. And uh, Jesus said, roll the stone away. And, uh, you know, Martha said, but, but Lord, by this time, not a good thing. He's, he's decaying. Uh, but Jesus called his name. Lazarus, come forth. And in that picture, we read that Lazarus was hopping to the entrance, still all wrapped up, because he could not have undone himself. Jesus said, unbind him. So this was not a, a resurrection like what Lazarus had. No, I, I would call this more as a disintegration, uh, perhaps an unexplainable evaporation. Uh, I would like to call this a rapturous resurrection. It, 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 it's described for us, if you will, in 1 Corinthians 15, what this is actually going to be like. Let me read that to you. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. And it goes on to say this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. 
This is talking about a resurrection. And what Jesus has demonstrated here is actually how all of us will be resurrected when that day comes. Matter of fact, uh, when we read in this text in 1 Corinthians, there is an argument given here about the actual resurrection and some statements made. Let me just highlight them in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians at verse 13 and on. It says this, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. Verse 17 says, And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have died in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men to be the most pitied. Goes on in verse 20 and says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as an, as an Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and after this, uh, those who are Christ at, at his coming. And so this is the event that's taken place. Jesus has risen as he had uh, prophesied that he would do. But we uh, go back in our text and we're reminded here at, at the end of this little section at, at verse 9, talking about these disciples, this is for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their homes. So they've seen inside the tomb. They, they still don't quite understand what's happened. They've, they're pondering. John evidently believed, but they went back to uh, wherever they were staying and the next thing we see in the story is that not only do Peter and John see, but Mary saw some things. So she comes back in verse 11 of our text. It says, But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, <laughs> what's fascinating to me is that this is Mary Magdalene. This is the Mary that had been, uh, we know from Luke chapter 8, she had had demons in her, seven demons to be, in, uh, in fact, and Jesus had cleansed her of seven demons, and she was now a follower of Jesus. Uh, her life had completely been transformed by her encounter with him. Her last name, Magdalene, is a, a kind of a, a, an interesting uh, idea. Down through history, there's been some uh, sense about her that has not always been true. Uh, some things have been said about her that are today still not true. But around the 17th century, the, the name Magdalene was being used to describe a reformed prostitute. And whether that's true or not, we do not know. All we do know is that Mary Magdalene was someone who had seven demons in her. Jesus cast them out, and her whole life changed as a result. And so we know this. Mary Magdalene loved the Lord Jesus, not in a physical way as many talk about today, but she loved the Lord Jesus who had forgiven her and cleansed her and, uh, and set her free from the enslavement of, of demonic uh, possession. And so Mary's emotional loss of having lost the Savior would have blocked her vision from understanding, first of all, the grave clothes lying there. That, that should have been enough proof for her, but she wasn't even seeing those. So God provided for her two angels. And, and what's fascinating is that as she's looking in and seeing these angels, she's not even recognizing that they're angels. She's speaking to them as though they're just two guys sitting in the tomb, which I find very unusual. Her preoccupation with the open tomb and the missing body of Jesus, it, it just blinded her from realizing that she's having a conversation with two angels. Well, that causes me to say this to us. Sometimes something similar happens to us. I don't mean that uh, 
I don't mean that you're going to see two angels. But sometimes we get caught up in our daily struggles. Sometimes our eyes are on problems and concerns that can just absolutely weigh us down. Uh, fears can build up in our life, and, and we can completely lose our spiritual eyesight. We're told, in, uh, as believers, we're told in the book of Colossians uh, something that uh, will help us through tough times like what we're going through right now. And, and here's something that the Apostle Paul has recommended for believers going through tough times. He says this, If then you were raised with Christ, in other words, if you are a person who has placed your faith in Jesus and you absolutely believe that he not only rose from the dead, but that you will also. If you're that person, he says, seek those things which are above. Get your eyes off of this world. He goes on to say where Christ is. Look where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above not on things of the earth. And so we need to, even uh, along with this problem with Mary, who's obviously lost her sense of hope. She's lost her compass. She's lost the very one who affected her so deeply that he's her only hope, and now he's gone. Well, Jesus has not left. He has not abandoned any of us today. Now, we know that through the fact and through God's word, but sometimes we act as though he's not there. And, and I want to remind us that Mary saw uh, the grave clothes, but she completely missed it. She was looking at angels and speaking with angels and was missing the whole moment. Don't let that happen to you. There's a song that uh, we uh, sing sometimes. It's one of my favorite old songs. And just the words say this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Mary saw, but she didn't really see. Something else Mary saw is in verse 14. It says, after she had spoken to the angels, it says, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and, and listen, and did not know that it was Jesus. <laughs> so Jesus spoke to her and said, woman, why are you weeping, and whom are you seeking? So she has this uh, response. She's supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And so again, we see Mary seeing but not seeing. This is really the ultimate in misplaced faith. To say that we uh, know someone and love them, as we all do the Lord Jesus Christ. But to be so distracted and so distraught that, uh, in this case, he is blurred, even obscured, if you will, from her vision. And again, I want to say this sometimes happens to us, and maybe today this may, may sound just like where you're at. You feel like you just don't recognize where Jesus is. You're, you're looking for uh, something from his word, and it feels like he's not communicating. You, you feel sometimes all alone, and you're wondering what's happening, and that can be so, uh, uh, so deadly in our lives. It can, it can pull us so far away from his presence. At least we feel like we're far away. And I want to say that surely you would think Mary would have at least recognized his voice, She's been with him for a long time now. But it took Jesus to say what she needed to hear to bring her back into focus. So he said to her, by simply using her name, uh, as he called out to her in verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. And suddenly she turned, it says she turned, and she said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. She suddenly recognized who he was when he called her name out. 
to uh, sort of bring her uh, you know, back to awareness, bring her out of the darkness that she was in and the fear that she was in and the loneliness she was in, the, the what ifs that she was worrying about, and to break through all of that and simply call her name personally. Mary, as soon as she heard that, she recognized who he was. Which reminds me of what Jesus says in John chapter 10 when he calls himself the good shepherd. And in verse 3 of chapter 10, he tells us this. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. One of the beautiful things about being a follower of Jesus is that we hear his voice and we oftentimes find ourselves in situations where we need Jesus to lead us out, sometimes out of trouble out of darkness, oftentimes out of temptation, out of struggle, out of heartache. We need him to lead us out of failure. We need him to lead us out from ourselves because oftentimes we fall prey to our flesh that you know, can go into an emotional down point and, and, and can build this... Uh, a layer of fear around us by our reaction to things, and that's our flesh doing that when we get our eyes off of him. Well, Mary was in a, in a point of desperation, and here's the Lord reaching through all of that, and he led her back to her Savior. And what an incredible thing he does. And, you know, it may be that someone here today, uh, listening today, is, is obviously perhaps in a place where you just feel as though there's no way out. And I want to say that here's the Lord Jesus Christ calling out, and he wants you to know perhaps today, and maybe he's calling your name gently to draw you out from where you are and remind you that he's never left you. So Mary finally saw. Then there's the disciples who saw in verse 19. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, that Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had, show, uh, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. You know, uh, they're in this place, it says on Sunday evening, the doors are shut, for fear of the Jews. That means the doors were locked. Even though Peter and John had been to the tomb, they're still huddled with their friends, uh, fearful of what's still coming. That, you know, eventually, maybe we're going to be hunted down and, and killed like he was. And so as they're hiding, and here it says Jesus came and stood in the midst. That means Jesus appeared. He just appeared. And he says, peace be with you. And while he's saying that, they're still fearful. And so what does he do? He shows them his hands. He shows them his side. He gave evidence of the reality of his resurrection. And immediately, he again greeted them and said, peace to you. The first time it was, peace be with you. You guys need peace. The second time it's, peace to you, as though he's inserting peace into their fear-filled lives. That's what Jesus does. Sometimes we, uh, we need a sense of him and his presence. We need peace uh, around us. We need, we need a sense of peace in the midst of turmoil and strife. But the Lord offers us more than that, not just peace in the environment that you're in, but he offers peace to you directly through a relationship with him. Then he added the statement, which is a very interesting thing to say at this point in time. Remember, they're, they've been fearful. They're hiding. They're, they're just doing everything that uh, you, would, you would sense that someone would do it who's lost their faith. Uh, the, so they're worried about all kinds of things. But what he says is so, is so interesting because the Lord says these words. And uh, he says, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. <laughs> what a statement to say. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. 
And it's as though all of a sudden he's saying to his disciples, guys, you're, you're locked in this room, you're hiding, but guess what? The mission that I called you to, you know, three years ago when I called you to follow me, the, the mission that you're on is really just starting. I, I'm calling you to remind you that the mission that you've been called to, uh, the Father is wanting to send you. I want to send you. He wanted them to know the mission is not over. It's just begun. Sometimes when we go through a hard time, a difficult time, a dark moment, sometimes we can feel like, I, I just can't go on. I, I just don't want to go on. And the still small voice of God, of course, breathes peace into our hearts when we turn our eyes on him. But as soon as we turn our eyes on him, I, I want to remind all of us as followers of Jesus, the mission continues. That's why I, I call the series that we've been studying Mission 2020, because we are in a continuous journey of following Christ, and the mission goes on. And he's not done with you yet, dear brother and sister. And even though you're sitting in your homes right now isolated, he's not done with us. There's still a mission to follow. There's still a purpose for following Jesus Christ. But there's a difference. Here's the difference. It's in verse 22 and to 23. In verse 22, he says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and then said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Interestingly enough, in this act that Jesus does, he's uh, doing something they absolutely critically had to have done in their life right now. He has suddenly empowered them with the Holy Spirit of God. So that now their fear would be replaced with fire. Instead of running away from Jesus under pressure, they would now run to him under pressure. Their faithlessness was replaced with faithfulness. And he does the same thing in our lives as, as we give our lives to Christ and he comes into our life, his Holy Spirit resides in us. It, it is that which, that, that person of Christ and, and the Father and now the Holy Spirit in our lives that empowers us to be faithful in faithless times, to take our stand when there's pressure, uh, to identify with Jesus when it's not popular. Now, in the story, uh, we all know the story that happens in verse 24, now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And so he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas uh, was with them, and Jesus came, it says again, the doors being shut, and he stood in the midst and said again, peace to you. And now that statement is probably mostly directed at Thomas. Thomas, you're wrestling in your heart. You're wrestling with this. You're you're refusing to believe the testimony of those who you've walked this journey with for three years. Now their testimony doesn't count. You have to have this additional uh, fact. And, and uh, so you're kind of behind the curve here, but I'm, gonna, uh, I'm here. And peace to you, Thomas. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, Thomas but believing. If there's one thing I can say to all of us right now at Easter time, it's this, that you would hopefully see, not the way John first saw looking in the tomb, not the way even Peter saw just quizzically uh, trying to figure it out, but you would see like John did the th this when John went into the tomb and he saw and he believed. These things are, are in the text. They're written for us for that very reason. And so 
Thomas responds to this moment of touching Jesus, and he, I assume, maybe he kneeled. I don't know. It doesn't say that, but I can imagine. In verse 28, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. By the way, uh, all of us here call Jesus Lord. He's our master. We follow him. We take our orders from him. But it's the first time in the New Testament that one of his followers actually called him my God. And it's absolutely necessary that someone identify and recognize this. And so on, on one level, Thomas, you know, had to have this touching moment with Jesus to, to actually believe. But what Thomas declares, no one else had declared that Jesus is not just my master, my Lord, but he's also my God. And that statement down through history is absolutely necessary because if Jesus was not God, then his death was meaningless. That's why he could rise from the dead because he was not man. He is God. And that declaration was Thomas, you know, signifying for all of Christianity Yes, you are not only Lord, you are God. And because I know that, I am pledged to follow you because of that. Well, now there's a statement given from Jesus that is precious because this is a statement that's given to all followers of Jesus Christ. So that means that today you are sitting at home watching this this statement is still actively uh, working in our lives. This is still a, a statement from Jesus that's still proactive. It's still happening. And here's what he says in verse 29. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Now listen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It's one of the greatest statements in all of Scripture because it's telling us that what Jesus has done for us on the cross and the fact that he's died and was buried and rose from the dead and the fact that we place our faith in who he is and what he's done for us and we trust that by faith. We give our lives to that truth. And Jesus is saying anyone who's done that, who has not seen, is blessed. That, that's an active verb. It's, it's continuous. That means he's still blessing us even today and even every day because we place our faith in him for that very reason. Do you hear that? So the best thing that you will ever do, or perhaps you've already done, is to say and believe, my Lord and my God. And if you've never said that before, I would add this, and my Savior. Because you can't say my Savior if you first don't recognize that he is Lord and God. Because no human being can save you from an eternal destiny apart from heaven and God, except God himself. What a great statement, and what a blessing if you would say that today. The third and final thing is this. We see him as the king who is eternal. Uh, three quick thoughts here. From verse 29 again, in the same verse, we read there uh, here that uh, I just mentioned that this continual blessing, <clears throat> that, that it's open-ended. And so uh, that also verifies that he is risen and he's eternal. That means that he's with us even now, knowing still our lives, for him to bless us even today, 2,000 years later. That means he's fully aware of you and I. That means he is present with you or I. So he's actively involved, continually blessing, and that's verification of his, of his having risen from the dead. The second uh, thing is this, uh, that belief in Jesus as being both uh, Christ, the Messiah, and Son of God that very belief brings us life. So in verse 31, he says, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so believing in him, that he is who he claimed to be, he's Christ and the Son of God, that belief brings you eternal life. Thirdly, 
He is eternal because He's returning. Just a brief mention in chapter 21, uh, he's having a conversation with Peter. And uh, he's telling Peter, Peter's going to, how Peter's going to serve him, and Peter, eventually, this is your future. And as they're having that conversation, uh, Peter, verse 21, looks back and, and says, uh, seeing John, Peter said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, I will, or if I will, or if I desire, is what he's saying, that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And there's a little phrase in that verse. Uh, you know, it doesn't make any difference what I do with John. You're going to follow me. But the point is, till I come, this is what you're going to do. And then it's repeated in verse 23. The saying went out among the brethren that somehow this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. He simply said, if I will or if I desire that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This little idea of till I come is so important for us because as believers in Christ, we are looking and watching and waiting for his second coming, which has not happened yet. But we have staked our faith on that very thing, his resurrection and then promising our resurrection uh, means that he has to come and resurrect us. So we're waiting for that glorious day. In fact, the last thing that Jesus says in the Bible, it's in the book of Revelation, the last thing he says to all of us who follow him, it's a promise from his word. Twice he says this. In verse 7 of chapter 22, he says this, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And then he says again in verse 20, Surely I am coming quickly. Easter is about resurrection. Easter is about hope in the living Christ. Easter is about eternal life with Christ. And Easter also is a reminder to me of those who yet do not have this message in their hearts. And if you're watching and you don't know Christ in a personal way, you've never given your life to him, you, you might say, well, yes, I believe that Jesus was a wonderful person, that he was moral. He, uh, he, uh, yes, I even believe he died on a cross, if you say so. But, but beyond that, the sense of resurrection, the sense of purpose of all this, I don't know if I get that. And I would just say to you that you've heard, if you've listened to this, you've heard clearly that Jesus Christ gave his life for the sins of men, and he's calling us to recognize that he's God, that he's Lord, that he's Savior. I can only have sin forgiven through him, and that if I choose to follow him, if I yield to him and say, you are Lord, you are Savior, you are Master, you are God, then I'm declaring that I believe in him, I trust him, and I'm determined to follow him as he's called me to himself. And you know what? I, if you do that, you will hear, if you even think that you want to do that, you will hear his voice calling your name. Somehow, whether it's actually audible or it's just something you hear deep in your heart, you will hear your name called as he identifies you and recognizes you and says, yes, I died for you. Yes, I want to lead you and save you and be your Lord and Savior and your God. And I hope that you hear that voice. Let's pray. Father, on Easter of 2020, we find ourselves in such an awkward place. This is not what any of us would have ever thought would take place. Those of us who are Christians, Lord, we, we know our Bibles, and so we look ahead to prophetic days, and we talk about what might happen in the last days. And then something like this comes along and surprises us. And all of a sudden we start thinking maybe we are in last days. Maybe it is real. Maybe you are returning soon. We don't know. But this we do know, Lord. That you have called us to yourself. Those of us who follow you have heard your voice. And we thank you for leading us out from darkness to light. And Lord, I ask that you would uh, speak to those who may be curious, those who are listening, 
those who maybe yet don't see with, with believing eyes, but Lord, may you just lead them to, to see the truths of your word and draw them to you, especially at this time of year. We give praise to you as a church. We praise you that you're living and that we have a, a living hope in Jesus Christ, which gives us great joy, great hope, great uh, peace in our lives. And we lift you up today as the King of kings and Lord of lords and certainly the God of our life. And we magnify Jesus now and ask that you would just uh, draw all people to yourself uh, during this glorious time. We uh, commit ourselves now to you, ask your blessing in the days ahead. In the name of our wonderful and living Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy Easter. Oh